In this video, I want to um, give you guys a little bit of an introduction to the uh, final project. And in the description of this video, you'll find uh, several sections, um, and they'll have times listed next to them. If you click on those times, it'll take you to those specific uh, sections in the video, uh, which can be helpful. So the first section is going to be the overview and the practical information. And because this project is broken into essentially three sections, we will then, I will then make a video, or maybe Tim and I, I'm not sure, we'll make a video um, for each of the uh, three sections. So we'll dis uh, specifically discuss those sections. So that way you can click on what you want. So as far as the overview, the first thing you need to know is that you're gonna be broken into about three teams of four students. So normally there's 12 students in the class, and if there's exactly 12 students, you'll be broken into three teams of four students. If there are not 12 students, um, you and your TA will use your judgment and you'll create uh, teams of about four students um, as necessary. So each team is going to use a different method to determine the amount of an active ingredient in, in an anid acid. And there's not a lot for me to show you during this section, so the picture is going to remain uh, constant and basically, basically it's just going to be me talking. So you're going to use different methods to determine the active ingredient in three different types of anid acids. Some of these methods may work better than others. The overall idea here is we've taught you several techniques in this course and in general chemistry we've uh, done, done many techniques as well. In organic we've done techniques and different techniques work well for certain things. Okay, And what we're going to do here is we're going to test techniques that we've learned specifically in this course and determine which of these techniques is appropriate for determining the amount of antacid in an antacid tablet. So ultimately the class's goal is determine the best method that for determining the amount of active ingredient in antacid. But each team is only going to try one thing. So you're not going to be responsible for trying all of the methods. Your team is going to um, be responsible for one of the methods. And then you're going to report back to the class how accurate and precise that method is. The other thing to be aware of is the best method, the most accurate and precise method, may not be the same for all of the active ingredients. So we need to think about which active ingredients certain methods work for if that's the case, or whether a certain method works for all of the active ingredients. That's possible as well. So we don't know. Our job here is to be scientists and figure it out. So I've said several times that we're going to use accuracy and precision in order to do this. Well, if we want to look at accuracy, we need to look at does the um, method have the amount of active ingredient that the serving size says it has. And luckily, we're using commercially available um, stuff. So by FDA requirements, I believe, the, the government requires that the companies put the label on how much or put on the label how much active ingredient is in each antacid. And you can find those right on the bottles, okay? Right on the bottles of the antacids that you have in the lab, um, you can find how much active ingredient should be there. So you can cal calculate the accuracy as a percent difference based on your methods. For precision, you need to make sure you're performing multiple trials so you can comment on the precision. And specifically, as usual, you're going to calculate the relative standard deviation in parts per thousand. The lower, the better. So I hope that's given you a general overview. Now I just want to mention what are the techniques. So one group is going to use gravimetric analysis in order to do this work. Gravimetric analysis will involve creating a precipitate and then filtering it out, measuring the mass of the precipitate, doing stoichiometry to back calculate the mass of the original active ingredient, and determining if that accurately and or precisely determines the amount of active ingredient in the sample. So one group does gravimetric analysis. That's one of the techniques. One group is going to do titration. So you're going to titrate um, these samples. You're going to have to do it in a little bit of a different way uh, because these are bases, right? Um, antacids are bases. So you can't directly titrate base with base. So you're going to have to intermediately add acid. And we'll talk about that in a little while in the individual sections. 
And the final group is going to use spectroscopy, which may seem a little bit um, hard to believe because these active ingredients are white. So basically, um, spectroscopy doesn't seem like it's going to work because if they're white, they're not absorbing visible light. And therefore, um, we're going to talk a little bit later in that section about how spectroscopy can be used or how we can make a solution that isn't white using these active ingredients. So these are the three techniques. Each of these techniques will have an individual section of this video below, and in the in the um, video description, you'll find the time when that section begins, so that your group can focus on, you know, the one that you need to do. There are also three antacids, so you're going to try each of these techniques with three antacids, and each group will try their technique, whether it's gravimetric analysis, titration, or spectroscopy, with each of the three antacids. So each group gets a technique, and then each group has three basically unknowns. So you have the equate antacid, which is calcium carbonate as the active ingredient. You're going to have milk of magnesia, which has magnesium hydroxide as the active ingredient. And then you're going to have the very well-named sodium bicarbonate antacid, which not surprisingly has sodium bicarbonate or baking soda as its active ingredient. So those are the three antacids that each of these techniques will be tried with. So now that you have a general idea of what the project is and what you're trying to accomplish, let's talk about some practical information about how this uh, project is designed. So basically, you have four lab periods to complete your project. The first lab period will be used to design your project. And when it comes to designing your project, there's lots of things to consider. And like anything, the more carefully you design it, the more smoothly it will go. So this is not something that you want to do kind of haphazardly or just feel like it's a free lab day or something like this, because with careful design, the experimental days can go pretty well. So, one, so as you design your project, there's, I have a list of questions that you want to think about. What experiments will you do? What specifically do you need to experiment on to determine how much active ingredient is in these antacids? What will you need um, to do them? So what chemicals and equipment do you have to have available in order to perform these experiments? Inevitably, there's probably going to be some solutions that you need to prepare. What solutions do you need? How much do you need? How will you make it? Specifically, how many grams of solute will you put in how many milliliters of solution? Because you're actually going to have to make these solutions. You want to be all ready to go, have it all figured out, that what exactly you're going to do and how you're going to prepare it the following day. Um, again, I said, how will you prepare them? Who will do what? Think efficiency. You don't want to have everybody working on every step of the project. If you need four solutions, maybe each person makes one solution. Maybe two people are assigned to making solutions and two people are assigned to setting up equipment. It doesn't matter how you decide what is most efficient, okay, but it is something you need to consider. So think about how you can be efficient and divide and conquer this work. Of course, we want you to consider the safety, the important safety considerations. So what toxic hazardous things are you working with and how are you going to be safe when you're when you're um, working with them? Most of the stuff, uh, with the exception of probably the antacids themselves, uh, you've worked with before and the antacids themselves aren't particularly toxic. Obviously, people eat them. All right. One really, really um, important consideration is how much antacid sample will you be needing for each experiment so it may not be reasonable to for example titrate an entire serving let's say a serving is two of these tablets it may not be reasonable to um, titrate an entire serving so if you're not going to titrate an entire serving how are you going to back calculate the amount in the actual serving and we did this when we did the um, blue food coloring in the candy, for example. We back calculated how much um, uh, blue food coloring was in a candy. So, or in a gram of candy, I think we did. So think about how you're going to do that because you ultimately need to know the amount of active ingredient in a serving size because that's what's on the bottle. So how are you going to figure that out? When you're creating your plan and your team is creating your plan, you are purposefully doing this during lab time. 
Okay, and if you work efficiently, you should be able to get this all done during lab time, and you have a computer available to you, so you can look stuff up as you go. You need to review your plan with the TA as you create it. It is not a great strategy to, to make your whole plan, write it up, and then submit it to the TA. Have conversations with your TA as you're creating your plan so they can help to um, guide you, give you advice, whatever, um, in order to help you create your plan. This is not to say you should say, hey, how do I do this, right? This is not the point. You should create the plan yourself, but you can get feedback, advice, whatever, if something may not work or it's going to be using, you know, you might have to use 500 milliliters to do a titration or something like that. They might be able to give you some feedback. Day two and three. So that was day one. Day two and three, you're going to perform the actual experiments in the lab. It is you are expected to design these experiments so you can do them all in one day. So you're going to divide and conquer the work. And each group should be able to complete all the experiments that they design in one day. Then you're going to use the second day to clean things up. Something may not work perfectly. You do, uh, um, you know, three titrations and you look at your deviations and your deviations are very um, high. All right. So say your RSD is 100 and, and you want it to be less than 25, something like this. So you have opportunities to repeat some work. The chances of everything going smoothly the first day are very slim. And that's not just because you're doing it. If I was doing it, it would be the same thing. Okay, inevitably, something doesn't work as planned, and you have to repeat it. So we're building in that time. Said another way, you don't want to design your experiments, so you do half the work day two, and you leave early or whatever, and then you do half the work day three, because then you're gambling that everything's going to go smoothly, and it probably won't. That's just how science goes. What's important is we learn to think about, did it go smoothly or didn't it? So what, as you're designing your experiment, think about what do I expect to get in this section of the experiment so that you can make an honest comment on whether that part of the experiment went smoothly. The experiments won't tell you, right? This experiment won't say, I failed. There's no red light that goes off or something like this. You have to look at the data and decide for yourself if it failed or if it could be improved or whatever the case may be. So build that in to your design. Finally, day four, you'll give a final presentation. You're going to present your findings on the accuracy and precision of your method for the three antacids. So you're going to report to the class your findings and whether you think that your method is an effective way of determining the amount of active ingredient in some or all of the three antacid samples. So I know this video um, section of the video was a little long, but basically I hope it gives you a general idea of what you're trying to accomplish and how you're going to accomplish it. Most of the, this section is encouraging you to figure out how to accomplish it. In the next three sections, one for each of the techniques, gravimetric analysis, titration, and spectroscopy, we will go over how um, more specifically, you can try to approach this problem. What you're not going to find in these sections of the video is a step-by-step -step guide for how to do the experiment. It's more a way to kind of wrap your head around it so that you can start to think about how to design the experiments for yourself. In this section, I'm going to talk about gravimetric analysis. So gravimetric analysis involves precipitating something and then measuring its mass and back calculating how much um, of the original compound of interest was in solution. So, uh, so let's look at the antacids. So in the antacids, we have equate antacid, which is essentially knockoff brand Tums, and it has calcium carbonate as the active ingredient. Calcium carbonate is chalk. So if someone says Tums tastes chalky, now you know why. So calcium carbonate is the active ingredient. In milk of magnesia, magnesium hydroxide is the active ingredient. And in sodium bicarbonate antacid, sodium bicarbonate is the active ingredient. So we need to precipitate something, some ion, that is basically going to fall out of solution in order to uh, determine the mass of the active ingredient in the original sample. Now, it may or may not be possible to uh, 
basically use a whole serving size. So if you can't use a whole serving size, remember that equate acid and milk and magnesium and sodium bicarbonate antacid aren't all active ingredient. There's other stuff in there as well. So we're going to need to measure the mass of the sample and then be able to find the mass of the active ingredient by gravimetric analysis and then back calculate per serving size if you don't use a whole tablet or two tablets, whatever the serving size is. So just be aware of that. But let's look at this from a gravimetric analysis perspective. In this case, we have calcium, these two cases, we have calcium and magnesium. There are salts of calcium and magnesium which are insoluble. In fact, calcium carbonate and magnesium hydroxide are insoluble salts, which is going to present its own challenge because we need to get these ions in solution before we can precipitate them. In the case of sodium bicarbonate, the cation, uh, the cation sodium, is not able to be precipitated. There are no common sodium salts that are going to precipitate. So we are not going to be able to do this. We're going to have to precipitate a bicarbonate. So we're going to have to approach these two a little bit differently. In this case, we're going to try to um, precipitate the bicarbonate. And in this case, we're going to try to precipitate the calcium and the magnesium. So we need to look at the two cases differently. Because they came first, the calcium carbonate and the magnesium hydroxide, I'm going to talk about them first. You don't necessarily need to do them first. And in fact, you should divide the work. So for the calcium and the magnesium salts, starting with calcium carbonate as a solid and magnesium hydroxide as a solid, I need to get these ions into solution so that I can precipitate them out and do gravimetric analysis. So what am I going to do? Well, what I'm going to do is add HCl. So I'm going to add HCl aqueous to this one and HCl aqueous to this one. And this is going to cause double displacement reactions. Ca will go with Cl. Chloride salts are generally soluble and calcium is no exception. And H will go with CO3 to get H2CO3, carbonic acid, which is not stable at room temperature and pressure. So what we end up with is, well, we have Ca2 plus Cl minus. We end up with Ca Cl2 aqueous. And then we end up with H2CO3, which decomposes into water liquid plus CO3, uh, sorry, CO2 gas like this. So these are basically what we're going to form. This gets the calcium ion in solution. So now it's soluble. Now we can precipitate it out. You can't just measure the mass of the calcium carbonate directly because it's mixed with a bunch of other stuff. So we need to get it into solution and then re-precipitate it out. Magnesium hydroxide, the same thing. In this case, we get Mg going with Cl and H going with OH to form water. Mg is also 2 plus, so we get Mg Cl2 aqueous, soluble because chloride salts are generally soluble and calcium and magnesium are no exception. And we get two waters because we have um, two OHs and we're going to need two HCLs because we need two CLs and that'll give us two Hs, so we get two waters. So this is basically what we're going to do. We're going to turn these insoluble calcium and magnesium salts into soluble calcium chloride and soluble magnesium chloride. A, an important note here when you're reacting this with HCl, you don't want to use too much. A little bit excess is fine, but a lot of excess is a problem because in the next step, we're going to add sodium carbonate. And when we add sodium carbonate, it's going to be reacting with HCl. If there's a huge excess of HCl, you'll destroy all your carbonate before it can react with your calcium and your magnesium. So don't, you don't want to do that. So how are we going to actually precipitate these things? Well, we're going to take CaCl2 aqueous and MgCl2 aqueous, and we're going to add sodium carbonate. And I'll leave it to you if you want to use a solution or a solid. You can think about sodium carbonate, um, which is going to work for you. And then you may not know, so you may have to try one and see what happens. All right, so we're going to add sodium carbonate. What's going to happen? Well, calcium is going to go with carbonate to form CaCO3. 
Carbonates are generally insoluble, so that's a solid. That's the precipitate that we're going to measure the mass of. And then we're also going to form two NaCl aqueous. Because Na goes with Cl, we get NaCl, and it'll be aqueous. Same thing down here. We form MgCO3 solid plus two NaCl aqueous. So this is basically how we're going to do the gravimetric analysis. These are the compounds that we're actually going to measure. Note that because we're actually using calcium carbonate to start with, some excess HCl and some excess sodium carbonate, said another way, calcium ion is the limiting reagent, this compound, the masses should be the same. So if your original sample it should be between 0.5 and 1 grams of this, it should have 0.5 between 0.5 and 1 gram of this. So the precipitate you want to make is between half and 1 gram. So you want to do your calculations, your amounts, so that you can get between half and 1 gram. But they should be exactly the same because they're the same compound. In this case, that's not the case. Here you're going to have to use the molar mass of this one and the molar mass of this one, along with the stoichiometry, which is all one to one, to figure out if you get x mass of this how much mass of this in the starting material since they have the same, don't have the same molar mass they're not going to be exactly the same so this is how we're going to approach the calcium carbonate and the magnesium carbonate precipitates you should get for all gravimetric analysis between 0 0.5 to 1.0 grams now this doesn't mean that this is what you're actually going to get after you do the gravimetric analysis and you filter it out and all that kind of stuff it just means this is what you should shoot for in your calculations remember not to use too much hcl because if you do it'll destroy your sodium carbonate and then the amount of sodium carbonate and whether you want it to be a solution or you want it to be a solid you can think about that. You may not have a good idea about that, okay? And that's totally okay. Um, if you don't, you try something, all right? You can test uh, different things and see what works. All right, so that gives us the first two antacids. The second antacid, the third antacid, I guess, contains NaHCO3. And we can make that aqueous by dissolving it in solution. Now here, we're never going to be able to precipitate a sodium salt. There's no common sodium salts that are insoluble. So we need to try to do something else, which is to precipitate this. And in this case, we're going to use calcium chloride, aqueous or solid. All right, one of these two things has to be in solution. If you mix solid this with solid this, nothing's going to happen. So you do have to have water there. Okay, again, you can try different things and see what works best. What's going to happen here is we end up with calcium bicarbonate, which is a solid. You might want to look up the solubility of this to have an idea at the beginning if it's going to work. And we're going to end up with 2NaCl aqueous because Na goes with Cl, Ca goes with HCO3, and we're going to need two of these because we need two sodiums and two bicarbonates, and we already have two chlorides. So this is basically what we're going to do. Again, our goal is to get between 0 0.5 to 1.0 grams of this compound precipitated. You are going to have to do stoichiometry because this and this don't have the same molar mass to back calculate the amount of active ingredient. So this is basically what you're going to do. The reagents that you'll have available to you are solid calcium chloride, which you can make into a solution, okay? Hydrochloric acid, which will be concentrated. It already is a, it already is a solution, but you can um, basically make it into a less concentrated solution. Please do not add concentrated uh, hydrochloric acid to this. And sodium carbonate, because you're going to need sodium carbonate, which again, you can use as a solid or make it into a solution, um, whatever works for you. So you'll have HCl, sodium carbonate, and calcium chloride. Um, these two are solids, and this is a about 12 molar solution. You want to design your experiments, as I've said several times, so that you're going to get between 0 0.5 to 1 gram of precipitate. Keep in mind that you want to ultimately present all data in terms of mass of active ingredient in a single serving. So you may not be able to use a whole serving 
of the antacid tablets, or however many milliliters magnesium hydroxide is a suspension, however many milliliters one serving is. So if you can't use a whole serving, make sure you know the mass or the volume of the serving um, and the mass or the volume that you're going to actually take so that you can back calculate how much was in a single serving. That's very, very important. You're going to design your experiments so that you're not going to use anything more than one molar solution and you're not going to make more than 250 milliliters of any solution for the entire experiment. So don't make massive volumes of very dilute solutions. Okay, so you want one molar or lower concentration and 250 milliliters of less of each solution. I said it several times, but I want to mention it one more time. Make sure you don't overdo it with the HCl in this step, because that HCl, excess HCl, will kill your sodium carbonate in this step. You want your sodium carbonate to be able to react with your calcium and your magnesium. You don't want it to react with the excess HCl if you had too much in the first step. So that's very, very important. As you are doing these types of experiments, you want to know the mass of precipitate you expect before you actually do your experiment. So another way, do the stoichiometry before you uh, start working on the experiment. You also want to be aware from a practical perspective that you're going to have to oven dry these things. So you may not be able to know until the following lab period, okay, how much of these you got. So just be aware that that is the case. Um, on day three, you may have to make arrangements to come back the next day or whatever to measure the mass of these things um, so you can get the final information in for your presentation. Okay, some things to consider of what you might want to change. Do you want to use solid sodium carbonate or a solution? Do you want to use solid calcium chloride or a solution? How fast or how slow do you want to add these together? Is stuff going through your filter, right? So or do you need bigger particles? How might you do that? Um, sometimes gentle heating. You do not want to be boiling these solutions or anything like that, but sometimes gentle heating um, can help. Sometimes ice can help. See if you can find somebody else who did this experiment and if they precipitated these things and what worked for them. Okay, uh, what concentrations of solutions do you want to use? Your maximum is one molar, but do you want to use 0.1? I don't know. Think about it. All right, are you going to add this solution to a solid instead? I already said that. And the other thing you might want to consider if you're not getting the correct mass of these things is what side reactions might be happening. I'll give you a hint. Sodium carbonate changes the pH of a solution, which makes other ion, another ion, more present in a solution. And could that ion also precipitate? Okay, that ion is hydroxide, right? The hydroxide concentration increases as the pH goes up. So just be aware of that as well. So I hope this gives you a general idea as promised, it's not a step-by-step -step guide of how to do this experiment. It's just some general information to help you to start to wrap your head around this um, part of the experiment. In the next section, we'll talk about the titration section of the experiment, which your group probably doesn't need to watch. In this section of the video, I would like to talk about um, titrations. So basically what we're looking at here is we have three antacids. We have equate antacid, which has calcium carbonate. We have milk and magnesium, which has magnesium hydroxide. And we have sodium bicarbonate antacid, which has sodium bicarbonate. So calcium carbonate is chalk and sodium bicarbonate is baking soda. And milk and magnesium contains magnesium hydroxide. But what you notice about all these compounds is they're bases. And if you remember, when we've done titrations in the past, you've titrated using base in the burette and the acid in the flask. Well, that's not going to work here because if you put base in the burette and you try to titrate these things, what you're basically going to end up doing is adding base to base. It's, it's going to start pink and it's going to stay pink um, if you're using phenolphthalein as an indicator. So basically what we're going to do here is we're going to use five milliliters of uh, hydrochloric acid. You're going to have to calculate that for yourself to partially neutralize at least 0.2 grams of the commercial antacid. 0.2 grams is probably not a whole serving. In fact, it isn't going to be a whole serving in any of the cases. So one thing that I suggest that you do is that you measure the mass of a serving. So if it's one tablet, one tablet. If it's two tablets, measure the mass of two tablets. Then look at the mass of the active ingredient in the serving. So you have an estimate of what percentage approximately of the mass is active ingredient. 
So say that the serving size is one gram and the amount of active ingredient is 0.75 grams. Well, then you know that there's 0.25 of other stuff in the commercial antacid. Um, and then you can give an estimate of how much of the active ingredient, the base, is going to be present in the acid. It is going to, I don't know why I said that, is going to be present in the 0.2 gram sample. Then you can calculate the concentration of the acid so that you can only partially neutralize 0.2 grams of the commercial antacid. Remember that ultimately you want to find out how much acid, excuse me, how much active ingredient is in the entire um, serving size. So if the entire serving size isn't 0.2 grams, you need to remember how to back calculate or figure out how to back calculate the amount of um, active ingredient in the commercial tablet and we did some back calculation work when we did the uh, blue food coloring experiment so there are some examples there he, however there is something that's completely new here and that's what i want to kind of touch on here so what is completely new is we're going to do this partial neutralization and like many examples that i've done in this class okay um and tim has done as well um i'm not going to give you ones with numbers that you're actually going to use. So these are made up numbers of a different antacid. So it says in an experiment, 0.2 grams of sodium carbonate antacid, unknown, was mixed with 5 milliliters of 0.35 molar HCl. These are made up numbers. This is about what you're going to use, probably for some of them, you're going to use at least this amount, and you're going to use 5 milliliters, but just may not be the concentration of your acid. So we had 0.2 grams of a sodium carbonate antacid, which is not all sodium carbonate, but it's sodium carbonate and some other stuff, and it's unknown, and it was mixed with 5 milliliters of 0.35 molar HCl. The remaining acid was titrated to the endpoint with 8.71 milliliters of 0.1021 molar NaOH solution. So some of this acid neutralized the sodium carbonate in the sodium carbonate antacid. Other of the acid had to be neutralized with 8.71 milliliters of 0 0.21, 0 0.021 molar sodium hydroxide solution. And it says how much sodium carbonate in grams was present in the 0.2 gram sodium carbonate antacid sample. So it's really important to remember your antacid is not 100% active ingredient. It's only partially active ingredient and it's partially other stuff. So how are we going to figure this out? Well, the first thing that I want to do is I want to find the moles of HCl total. So the total number of moles of HCl that are present. Well, I mixed 5 milliliters of 0 0.0350 molar HCl. So if I do 0 0.00500 liters of this HCl solution times in every one liter of this HCl solution, there are 0 0.0. 350 moles of HCl. And that means in total, there are 1.75 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of HCl. Total of present to react. Some of this reacted with the active ingredient in the pill, and some of it reacted with the 8.71 milliliters of the 0 0.1021 molar NaOH solution, the actual titration that was performed. So now I want to find the moles of HCl titrated, the ones that actually reacted with the NaOH. The remaining moles must have reacted with the sodium carbonate in the antacid tablet. So how am I going to figure that out? Well, I need a balanced chemical equation, one that you should be very familiar with. We have HCl aqueous plus NaOH aqueous gives us sorry, gives us salt, NaCl, aqueous plus H2O liquid. So it's all one-to-one. -one. So we react HCl and NaOH, we get salt and water. And we start with, in this case, 8.71 milliliters of this NaOH solution, which then we want to ultimately find how many moles of HCl. So essentially, we want to go from liters of NaOH to moles of NaOH using the molarity to moles of HCl using the balanced chemical equation. We don't care about the molarity of the HCl or anything like that, so we can stop here at moles. So starting with um, 8.71 milliliters divided by 1,000, 0 0.00871 liters of NaOH 
times in one liter of this NaOH solution, there happens to be 0 0.1021 moles of NaOH. Then we want to convert it to moles of HCl. It's one to one. So for every one mole of NaOH, there is one mole of HCl which when we do this math, we get 8.89 times 10 to the minus four moles of HCl. So this is how many moles of HCl were reacted in the titration. This was the total number of moles present. This is how many were reacted by the titration. So what we need to do is we need to find the moles of HCl reacted with antacid. And to do that, we simply subtract. We take the 1.75 times 10 to the minus 3 moles that we originally put into the solution when we added 5 milliliters of this, sorry, and we subtract out the ones that reacted with the NaOH, or 8.89 times 10 to the minus 4 moles. And when we do that math, we get 8.61 times 10 to the minus 4 moles of HCl that reacted with our active ingredient because it was no longer present in the solution. It did not react with the NaOH during the titration. So this is how much reacted with the antacid. But that's not good enough because we're not asked for how many moles of HCl reacted. We're asked for how much sodium carbonate in grams was present. So now we want to convert that to grams of Na2CO3 present in the antacid. Remember, again, that the antacid is not 100% active ingredient. In some cases, they could be as low as like 30% active ingredient, I think, in these um, particular examples. So let's take uh, a look. Don't quote me on that because I don't remember exactly. So what do we need? Well, we need to know the balanced chemical equation. In this case, we have... HCl aqueous reacting with Na2CO3 aqueous to form um, NaCl aqueous. And we get H2CO3, which breaks up into water liquid plus CO2 gas. All right, we need two of these and we get two of those. So this is the balanced chemical equation. Well, now we have our moles of HCl that we know reacted with the antacid, the active ingredient in the antacid, and we have a balanced chemical equation. So we can convert from moles of HCl to moles of sodium carbonate, and then finally to grams of sodium carbonate using the molar mass. We can finally answer this question. So starting with the moles of HCl, which is 8.61 times 10 to the minus 4, moles of HCl times, now we can convert that to moles of sodium carbonate using the balanced chemical equation. There's two moles of HCl for every one mole of sodium carbonate times, now we can convert it to grams of sodium carbonate for every one mole of sodium carbonate. The molar mass is 105.99 grams of sodium carbonate. So ultimately, there are 0 0.046456 grams of sodium carbonate present in this sample. So we took a 0.2 gram sample of antacid and 0 0.0456 um, grams of it were sodium carbonate you would need to, and I'm not going to show you how to do it, then need to back calculate this to figure out how much sodium carbonate is in a whole serving. To do that, you're going to need to know the mass of a serving, so the mass of one or two pills, whatever a serving is determined to be, or in the case of magnesium hydroxide, some volume, okay, and you're going to need, um, you're going to need to know uh, how to do that back calculation. So it's basically a proportionality. It's exactly a proportionality. So this is basically um, the new type of calculation. So what are you doing? You're taking your antacid. You're reacting it with some amount of HCl where there's excess HCl. Then you're titrating that excess HCl with sodium hydroxide solution. 
using all that information, you could find the amount of acid, or excuse me, the amount of active ingredient in your approximately 0.2 gram sample or more. You can use more than 0.2 grams, you just can't use less. So that is basically that. What are you going to need to actually do this experiment? Well, you're going to need some sodium hydroxide solution and you're going to need to know the concentration of it. So you should prepare a 0 0.05 molar sodium hydroxide solution from solid and standardize it in triplicate against KHP. Make sure that you use at least 10 milliliters of the sodium hydroxide solution for each uh, titration and we leave it to you to calculate the appropriate mass of KHP. So you are going to need sodium hydroxide solution. Note that I used about a 0.1 molar solution. You're going to use about a 0.05 molar solution. So just be aware I didn't use the same example. That's pretty typical here. Okay. Be sure that when you do this, your RSD of the three titrations is under 25. You also don't want to be using the automatic titrator and the pH probe for this. You want to do it the good old-fashioned way with phenolphthalein indicator by hand. You want to do all these titrations by hand. You don't want to be using the automatic um, titrator. Also remember that you're going to use this sodium hydroxide solution for about 15 titrations if everything goes well and more if you have to repeat some titrations. So make sure you make enough of it. Now, please be reasonable, all right? You don't need two gallons or whatever, um, five liters of this stuff. So please just use um, an appropriate amount, but make sure you have a little bit extra. You're also gonna need to prepare an uh, HCL solution such that five milliliters will partially neutralize at least 0.2 grams of antacid. We talked about before how you might estimate how much antacid excuse me, how much active ingredient is in 0.2 grams of antacid. To do that, simply measure the mass of um, the act, uh, single serving. So if it's one pill or two pills, measure that whole mass. Then look at the bottle to see how much active ingredient should be in that entire mass, and then you'll know roughly the percentage, and then you can estimate, by multiplying that percentage by 0.2, how many grams of the active ingredient will be in your 0.2 gram sample. Remember, you can use more if you want to. All right, then you're going to titrate the unreacted HCL with the NaOH that you standardized. Okay, and then you can, as we just described, determine the mass and the moles of the active ingredient. So the next thing I want to talk about is what do you have available to you? Okay, you have hydrochloric acid available to you, which you can dilute down uh, to the appropriate concentration such that it'll react with some of, but not all of, the active ingredient in a uh, 0.2 gram sample of the antacid. You have methyl red. Methyl red is an indicator and it's ready to go with just a few drops of it. If there's carbonates or bicarbonates in your active ingredient, use methyl red because you can form carbon dioxide in your water solution, which will then form carbonic acid and make the solution slightly acidic. When this happens, it can be difficult to get the pH up to eight so the, phenol the phenolphthalein won't turn pink. Methyl red turns pink at a lower, P or it turns colors at a lower pH. Um, so basically, uh, the carbonates won't become a problem. You can use phenolphthalein solution for the other uh, ones that don't have carbonates in there. Please remember that you're doing all of these titrations by hand. You don't want to be using the, a pH meter and stuff like this um, because that could just cloud the issue and it can definitely take longer. You're going to use potassium hydrogen phthalate. Remember that you need to calculate the mass of the potassium hydrogen phthalate required for the standardizations. Make sure your R squareds are low for your standardizations. Also, make sure that your R squareds are low for your titrations with the antacid samples. Try to, if you try to get your samples around the same mass, um, you can do it directly, a direct comparison. If they're not um, around the same mass, then you have to do a proportional comparison, which can be a little bit more challenging. But you don't want your data to be bad because your titrations aren't reproducible. So make sure your standard deviations are low. And then finally, you have sodium hydroxide to make your sodium hydroxide solution. And as mentioned before, you want to make sure that you calculate um, or you make enough sodium hydroxide solution such that you have plenty to do all of the titrations, but not a ridiculous amount um, that we're going to have to throw away at the end of the semester. All right. So that is basically that. Please be sure 
that you know what to expect for each of your titrations. So you know the approximate volume of excess HCl that should be there, and then the approximate volume of NaOH, it should take to titrate that excess HCl. This will allow you to know if there's errors in the titration or if there's errors in the method. If you start to find errors in the method, or even if you don't, if you want to look this up, you could try to look the, up other um, experiments uh, for students where these types of titrations are done, and that may give you some tips or tricks on you know, what you might want to do or things you might want to consider or so on and so forth. This is a fairly common um, lab experiment, although they may not have used these exact antacids, um, it is a fairly common lab experiment. So that's basically that. Final thing is another note about efficiency. You're going to have to do at least 15 titrations. And that's if everything goes swimmingly and you want to get those all done the first day. So you got to divide and conquer. Please do manual titrations, not the automatic titrator. If you do that, it's going to take even longer. Okay, I can usually do a manual titration in a minute or two if I'm being careful. Um, with the automatic titration, titration, now you're talking, you know, this might take 15 or 20 minutes uh, to do this single titration. So please do manual titrations. I hope you found this helpful, and I'm going to move on to the next section where we talk about um, spectroscopy. In this section of the video, I want to talk about um, spectroscopy. So we're going to use spectroscopy to determine the concentration of uh, three unknown compounds, which are all light. And this may not be possible. Okay, so what I'm going to go through here is um, the sodium bicarbonate example. And I would like you to think about how you could apply this concept to the magnesium hydroxide and the calcium hydroxide. Uh, calcium carbonate. So we do have three unknowns. We have a quate antacid, which is like Tums, which contains calcium carbonate. And we have milk of magnesia, which contains magnesium hydroxide. And we have sodium bicarbonate antacid, which contains, of course, sodium bicarbonate. So this is the one I'm going to focus on here, as I just mentioned. And these two, you can think about how you would be able to do that. Please note that it may not be possible uh, to do this. So if that happens, so be it. Um, but if it, you don't think it's possible, you need to explain why it's not possible. It's kind of that kind of a thing. All right. So let's take a look at um, what we're going to be doing here. And we'll try to um, understand what's going on. So what you're going to do is you're going to make 250 milliliters of a 0.1 molar copper 2 acetate uh, solution. It may or may not take this copper to acetate a long time to dissolve. I'm going to find out if we have a sonicator um, available because uh, sometimes that helps. Sometimes it doesn't, but sometimes it does. So if we have one available, um, I'll ask that it be put in the lab and then um, that might be able to help you. So you're going to make 250 milliliters of this 0.1 molar copper to acetate solution on day one so that if it isn't dissolving very quickly, you can stir it. You could stir it for a couple hours and it will dissolve, um, but you don't want to have to wait for that. So you can stir it and then it'll be ready for you on, on the next day. Then what we're going to do is we're going to take that copper acetate solution. So copper acetate is this, okay, and it's going to be aqueous. And we're going to react it with sodium bicarbonate. Like this. And we're going to get a double displacement reaction where copper is going to go with bicarbonate and sodium is going to go with acetate. So copper is 2 plus, it's copper 2 acetate. Sorry, I'm not on the screen, I just noticed. So we have copper acetate reacting with sodium bicarbonate. So copper is 2 plus and it's going to react with bicarbonate, HCO3, which is minus. We cross them and we get Cu H. Oops, HCO3, 2, which is a solid. Na goes with acetate, and we end up with sodium acetate. Na, CH3, COO minus, or CH3, COO, Na is fine too, which is aqueous. Okay, there's two acetates. We need two bicarbonates. So we need two sodium bicarbonates, and we get two sodium acetates. So this is the reaction that we're going to do. And what you're going to do 
is you're going to do this three times. Now, the sodium bicarbonate in the pill is going to be what you're going to be reacting. And I suggest you start with one pill. Okay, and you're going to do it in triplicate, so you're going to do one pill three times. I didn't say this in previous um, uh, videos for the other sections, but I should have. Uh, one, you're going to want to know the mass of the pill. And then the second thing is you're going to want to crush that pill up before you try to dissolve it. It will dissolve much faster if you crush it with a mortar and pestle uh, before you actually try to dissolve it. So you may want to tell your uh, classmates of that if they're trying to dissolve the entire pill or, you know, break it into pieces and then dissolve a piece, something like that. So you do want to use the crush pill. All right. So that is basically the reaction that's going to occur. And we're going to form this solid copper bicarbonate which we can then filter and use in the next step of the reaction now there's a couple things to note why are we using copper well we're using copper because copper is blue so we can use visible spectroscopy in order to measure the concentration of copper using a calibration curve and in a few minutes i'll talk about that calibration curve also um here we're producing a precipitate which has an ion of interest so we can use stoichiometry to back calculate you're going to want to think about whether this is going to work for copper or calcium carbonate or for magnesium hydroxide again if you don't think it's going to work you need to explain why all right so then what are we going to do with this copper bicarbonate we're going to take this copper bicarbonate solid and we're going to react it with acetic acid and you're going to make 100 milliliters of one molar acetic acid so we're going to react it with ch3 cooh aqueous and you're going to make 100 milliliters of one molar acetic acid then what you're going to do is a reaction this will dissolve and we're going to turn it back into copper acetate aqueous plus um, the H goes with the carbonate. And so we get H2CO3, which gives us H2O liquid, because carbonic acid is not very stable, and CO2 gas, like so. So you may be asking yourself, well, why are you doing this? Um, first of all, we need a two here to make this a balanced chemical equation. Well, the reason why you're doing this is because if you're using excess copper acetate in the first step, then the limiting reagents, your bicarbonate. And then in the second step, you're, lose, you're using excess acetic acid. So your limiting reagent is your copper bicarbonate. It means that the amount of this that is generated in solution is can stoichiometrically be related to the amount of this that was originally in the sample. I am not going to show you how to do that back calculation, but you do need to be able to do that back calculation. So that's basically why you're doing this. So this is a blue solution. How are you going to figure out the concentration of this blue solution? Well, what you're going to do is you're going to make a calibration curve where you have absorbance here, and it should be between about 1 and 0.1. And you're going to have the concentration of Cu, CH3, COO2, on your x-axis and you're going to need to figure out these concentrations remember that you're going to have this stock solution so you can use some of this stock solution to do this reaction and you can use other of this stock solution to generate a calibration curve i recommend that you measure the absorbance of the original stock solution okay which is going to be your 0.1 molar and if it's not going to be um on the calibration curve, dilute it maybe 10 times, or if it's like 1.3, dilute it a little bit, whatever the case may be, so that you can fall on the calibration curve. Once you find something with an absorbance around one, take about 80% of it, 60% of it, 40% of it, 20% of it, so that it falls and you end up with a calibration curve in this range.
So we leave it to you to figure out how exactly to make that five point uh, calibration curve. If you do have time, you should make the calibration curve more than once. All right, starting from solid copper um, acetate, because it's never a good idea to just have one calibration curve, because if for whatever reason you screw up that first solution, then all your dilutions are screwed up, and then therefore your concentration isn't good. We always repeat our calibration curves in triplicate, just to be sure. Then what you're going to end up with, of course, is graph. You're going to use Excel to get y equals mx plus b. You're then going to take your unknown, make it so it falls on the calibration curve. You may have to do a dilution and back calculate. We'll see. Okay. And then basically you can use this, which is going to give you an absorbance, which is a Y value. You can solve for X, which will give you the concentration of this. You can then use the stoichiometry to back calculate the mass of this. Note that when you do this reaction, the second reaction, you need to have a known volume. Said another way, you need to take this solid, um, copper bicarbonate and get it into a known volume of solution. What I suggest you do is use a relatively small amount of the acetic acid to transfer it into a volumetric flask and then top it off with acetic acid after that. If you try to, um, if you try to transfer this solid, it's going to be kind of wet and goopy and it's not going to be easy. So dissolve it first and less than will fit in the volumetric flask, of course, and then top off the volumetric flask with the acetic acid. The exact volume, that's up to you. All right, we're not giving you all the details here. That's not the point of this video. So that is basically that. Once you, once you have in triplicate, used this calibration curve and measured the absorbance of the solutions three times and found the concentration of uh, the copper bicarbonate and then back calculated the mass of sodium carbonate in your pill, what you want to do is then compare that to the amount of sodium uh, carbonate sodium bicarbonate that it says on the manufacturer's bottle. Now you have one big advantage because you're using a whole pill for your sample size, so you don't need to do any calculations there. You can directly find the mass, and that is the mass in one pill because you started with one pill. Finally, okay, before we get to some of the practical stuff, consider how you could use this for calcium carbonate and or magnesium hydroxide. And it may or may not be possible in both cases. So this may or may not work. This may or may not work. But think about if they will or won't work and why. All right. So that's basically that. So I want to move back to some of the uh, practical stuff. So you have copper 2 acetate monohydrate available to you, and you're going to need to make 250 milliliters of a 0.1 molar solution. Again, it may not dissolve very well. We will try to get a sonicator for you uh, to try and ease the process. And you're also going to have available to you glacial acetic acid, and you're going to have to turn that glacial acetic acid into... Um, uh, I forgot exactly the concentration of the acetic acid, uh, 100 milliliters of one molar acetic acid. So you're going to want to look up the molarity of glacial acetic acid. You can find that easily online and then turn it into 100 milliliters of 0.1 molar acetic acid. <coughs> so that is your basic goal. One, a couple other things that I want to mention. There's two possible errors here. Okay. There's one error in the accuracy and there's another error in the precision. So you may not calculate that you find there should be as much sodium bicarbonate as it says on the pill bottle, okay? So that's a problem with the accuracy. It might be low. And if you get a low amount of sodium bicarbonate, I would strongly look into the solubility of copper bicarbonate. Because if this is somewhat soluble in water, then it's not all gonna precipitate a solid as a solid, and you're essentially gonna throw some of it away, which is not ideal, because you're gonna filter off this solid and then add to the solid the acetic acid. So essentially in your filtrate, the stuff that goes through your filter, you're gonna throw away some of this. So think about that. But there's another type, possible type of problem that is going to be easier for you, right? Because this is a problem you can't fix. You can't make copper bicarbonate less soluble. Maybe you can, all right? If you decrease the temperature of the solution, for example, maybe that'll make it less soluble and maybe that'll help. Um, I just thought of that just now. However, there's another issue, which is the precision. 
So if you do these three trials and you don't find that you get the same mass of sodium bicarbonate in all three trials, you can think about ways that you can make it more precise. So the idea here is on day two, you're going to do all of this, these experiments, all three of them. All right, this is going to take a super, super long time. You should be able to get it done with four people in a three hour lab period. You do want to think about efficiency. You do want to divide and conquer. But that being said, if these masses are not all the same, on day three, one, you might want to think about, well, how do I get more of this? And I just gave you an idea, cool down the solution. But the other thing you're going to want to think about is, how do I get a consistent reproducible amount of this? And that's going to involve trying to standardize your volumes. Okay, so even if you can't get an accurate value, focus on trying to get a precise value. And maybe it's not possible, okay, um, but maybe it is. So being consistent and that kind of thing is going to help with that. So I hope this gives you a general idea of how you're doing spectroscopy. I know it probably seems a bit weird uh, to try and analyze white powders by spectroscopy, but that is the challenge put forth to you. Remember that the overall idea here is that not every technique you learn works for every sample. So another way, there's a reason we teach you all of these techniques. So I hope um, you found this video useful and helpful, and I do thank you for watching.